I slip my tendrils inside of squigs and frigs, ready to instantly kill the two closest enemies to me if this becomes a fight. Two more tendrils prepare shards of my soul, anyone that attacks me is going to switch sides. The animancy cat is likely already out of the bag, I will not hesitate to use it to save my life. No order to kill comes, however. Sky just glowers furiously down at me, his words like acid. You're saying I'm like a noble? He hisses. You're literally sitting on a throne, I counter. He blinks. I gesture once again to his ridiculously large, lopsided chair. I, it's ironic, he insists. It's not actually a throne. I'm being subversive. Aha. Uh -huh. Anyway, you remind me of Penelope, yeah. Both of you frame trust as a... A transaction. Like oh yeah, I know I was a huge asshole in the past, but it's okay because I have stuff you want. It's kinda weird. What I have to offer you is a city without hunger, Sky insists, quickly losing patience. We will soon be strong enough that the nobles will be forced to listen to us. We will take their wealth and uplift our starving city into one that can actually prosper. I nod. I'd like that. As would I. Sky agrees, smiling. So we agree, then? I sigh. I guess I can hardly judge him for not getting it. I barely get it, I'm certainly no expert on human emotion. I don't understand why people do the things they do, why people think the way they think. So I'll spell it out for him. No, I say bluntly. We don't agree. Because I don't care how appealing the things you say you stand for are. I still remember seeing my mom come home with more broken bones than teeth. I still remember the nights without food because your people demanded repayment. I still remember who runs the rings that Rowan apparently gambles at. I don't care what you have to offer. Here's my offer, leave me and my family alone, don't give me any more reason to care about you, and I won't start turning your men into corpses. I could sure use more of them anyway. The tension of the room draws thicker as the severity of my threat sets in, the seriousness on my face matching the conviction in my soul. Squigs and Frigs silently draw their weapons on either side of me, but I'm ready if they come. These bastards will not touch my family any longer. I'm going to make sure of it. Vita, the man on the stupid throne in tones, his calm voice not matching the look of fury on his face, out of appreciation for our similar origins and how respectful you've been so far, I'm going to let that one threat slide. What? Had I been respectful? I thought I was being pretty purposefully obstinate. Regardless, the weapons get put away. I slide my tentacles back out of the bodies of those close to me. I think we can still be friends. I'm going to honor your request, and give you a week to see I'm a man of my word, Sky intones with mock magnanimousness. Think on what I've told you. We'll talk then, to see if your stance on employment has changed. Why the fuck does he think my stance on employment would just randomly change? Has he not listened to a word I just said? It's almost like... I scowl, glancing over at Capita. Cognomancer. Holy shit. If she's messed with Lin or Rowan souls, I'm going to fucking shatter her. After I make her spend a few days as one of Penelope's rats. I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about, I lie. Goodbye, Mr. Sky. I don't wait to be dismissed, turning and exiting the absurd throne room. A Cognomancer. A Cognomancer. Didn't I just demonstrate I'm not going to be affected by that, though? Is the week all about giving Capita more time to prepare something for me? Is she going to go after the kids? My team? Shit, shit, shit. I need to figure something out. I stalk angrily down the hallway, squigs and frigs effortlessly keeping up with me. I can just tell Penelope about it, warn her who to look out for. The rest of the team, not so much. Not unless I want to field questions like how do you know? And why aren't we calling the Templars? Obviously, I can't call in the Templars because they'll wonder how I discovered an Animancer, which... Hello. A cheerful woman's voice announces, startling me by slamming open a door nearby and walking out. It's Capita, because of course it is. How the fuck did she get ahead of me without me noticing? Was I just not paying attention? You leave the dragon's lair, its owner pleased and infuriated in equal measure. Capita trills, falling in step with me and dismissing squigs and frigs with a single motion. Aha! A work of art you are, beautiful and true. The two assassins depart without a word as I give a very confused glare in this strange soul cognomancer's direction. Sheesh, I didn't think I ate that much of her soul. Ah, uh, 
Did I break you or something? I ask. Capita just laughs. Broken I am, but not from you. Come, come, O oh work of art, she who sees further. I wish to speak with you. I'm starting to see why your boss never had you say anything yourself. Aha! As quick of wit as you are of spirit, O oh work of art. That was not a joke, but okay. I sigh, exiting the Draken's home base and staring up at the dull, yellow sky. Capita continues to follow me, which is still annoying even though it's exactly what I was hoping she would do. My name isn't work of art, I insist. It's Vita. Yes, yes. Life you are, and a life you continue to be. With the tumor that holds me whole, I felt it when we touched. The grandest work of art, indeed. I can't tell if you're insane or just being purposefully obtuse, I grumble, cutting down an alley that will take us far from any prying eyes and ears. Capita grins a disturbing show of teeth, just a single step from laughter. One does not preclude the other, O oh work of art. I glower at her, continuing to move further away from witnesses. Her soul might be bigger than mine, but if she was supposed to kill me she would have done it in the room with everyone else. If she's supposed to cognomancy me. Well, she already tried. What do you want? I ask plainly. What does anyone want with a work of art? She giggles. To admire. Have you messed with my family's souls, cognomancer? I growl. She tilts her head, staring with a confusion which I can't tell is real or fake. Of course I have, a oh work of art. Such is my duty. I whirl on her immediately. I'm already right up in her face so I draw my knife, tentacle-assisted limbs moving the blade to her neck in an instant. She stiffens, her muscles tensing. But she doesn't move away, her smile firmly in place. Can you not fix them yourself? She taunts. Alas, a work of art yet unfinished. You have need of a palette, then, even one so smeared as myself. Maybe, I hiss, pressing the knife further. But I don't need you alive for it. Ah, she murmurs, pulling ever so slightly back. Then you do not need me dead, either. I will undo what I have done. It is not much, this one is no artist. You think I'm letting you near them again off a leash? I snap. She somehow grins even wider, and I have only the barest instant to recognize the feeling of a talent activating in one of the halves of her soul. I'm too slow, and suddenly she's gone, appearing behind me before I know what's happening. There was no movement, no interposing time. She's not just fast like Remus or Lynn. She was simply in one place, and then another. I whip tentacles her way but only have slight perches on her soul and in the time it takes me to turn around her palm is out and her other half is charging its own talent at my face. What the fuck is this bullshit? Is she tri-talented? Oh, how beautiful. She coos. I see you when we touch, O oh work of art. I have sapphire and arms of steel. Shut up, I hiss, pulling and squeezing at her being. What are you? Let go, she requests softly. Breaking you is not a crime I would relish. Her hand is still poised to do. Whatever her third talent is supposed to do, but she hasn't truly activated it, just readied it. It's clearly a peace offering, either because it's a bluff and her talent isn't even offensive, or because she genuinely has no desire to use it on me. Other than anger and paranoia, which to be fair, I have plenty to spare for this lady, I don't actually have much reason to risk going for the throat. I pull my knife and tentacles back, though I keep both ready. What are you? I ask again. Guess, she taunts jovially, stepping back and twirling in a circle. Hmm. I do have a guess. While I have little to go off of, the clues fit. She's got animancy abilities, she looks like two souls got smashed and stitched together, and of course she seems nuttier than a bag of almonds. Are you a splice? I ask. A splice? She giggles, nodding happily. Tis what the zealots call me though it is a cruel name for sketches such as I. To speak so little of why we suffer, to not intimate the purpose for we discarded failures. Cruel, a cruel name it is. Yet I forgive you, O oh work of art. I always shall. She pats me happily on the head, though I slap her arm away immediately. You fucked with my family's souls, I accuse. Indeed. She agrees. But for you, O oh work of art, I shall happily unfuck. She leans in close to my ear, putting a hand to her mouth and stage whispering at a normal volume. It will be our little secret, she whispers. The clouds need not tell the sky. 
But this is all I will deny him for you. The work of art should join him, yes. Join him, or join you? I grunt. Is he not just your puppet? Someone to draw attention away from the real leader? For the first time, Capita's grin drops. She looks directly at me, her face dead serious. No, she answers, firmly and clearly. Never. Sky is. He is. She waved her arms around vaguely, the moment of lucidity ending as soon as it arrived. A smile plasters itself back on her face in an instant. Join, she insists, a sing-song cadence returning to her tone. The rot of the city will be cut out, for life to grow in its place. There will be a place for life and art, and a lively work of art you are. But first, I scratched your favorite toys, so I must fix them. My family yard toys, I growl. Ah, she exclaims, grinning brightly. Family. Yes. That's the word I was forgetting before. How easily so many things fall through the crack, yes? She pats her belly over where her soul rests, the purple, animancy talented goop in the middle oozing out the broken bits like pus. Toy or not, though, I gave them a scratch. Just a scratch. I am incapable of much else. Just a paper cut of the soul. Yet how paper hurts. A fearsome weapon, employed properly. Come, come. I will show you, you will see. She starts wandering off in a different direction, all but skipping as she does. I scowl, following from behind. I almost fucked up here, didn't I? I crushed this girl's attempts at cognomancy and forgot to worry if she had other tricks up her sleeve. Where are we going? I ask. The casino, of course. Capita Crows. The great and terrible devourer of wealth. You wish to see your kinomancer, and he is there. I scowl. Really? At the casino right now? How convenient. So you're going to get rid of his gambling addiction, then? Capita raises an eyebrow at me. Did you not wish him unfucked? I, yes? She shakes her head. The swirling rainbow did not receive his love of numbers and odds from I, nor did I place in him a burning need to recover what he rightfully lost. No. I have only given him what I give all who cross the sky. And what would that be? I ask. She grins. Terror, the cognomancer answers, of the inevitable fall. Is that the place? I ask, pointing towards an utterly nondescript building in front of us. Indeed, O oh work of art. Your vision sees true. I frown, nodding without looking in Capita's direction. It's easy to guess the right building since I can feel Rowan's soul underneath it. Rowan markets his street cons as games of skill partially to draw arrogant customers, but mostly because gambling is illegal in Skyhope. There's little question that the casino is owned and operated by the Drokans, and it makes as much sense to me as anything that the place would be hidden underneath what looks like some kind of warehouse. I sigh, heading towards the entrance with what feels like stone in my legs. I'm not at all looking forward to talking with Rowan about this. It just... How could he betray us like this? How could he piss our money away when we're starving to death? I could almost understand Lynn doing it, but Rowan? He's supposed to be the responsible one, the smart one, the cautious one. He's supposed to know right from wrong. I'm the one that made a promise to him, but it feels like he's the one that broke our agreement. With Capita leading the way, we have no trouble entering the warehouse or the secret area underneath it. The main floor itself seems to be actually used for its intended purpose with members of the Drokens moving around crates of who knows what inside. The pink-haired woman is instantly recognized by the gang members, who step aside without question. A palpable fear fills the halls wherever we walk, the people who see her apparently wishing they didn't. I get the impression that you're not really well liked around here, I comment. The sky is beautiful till it rages, destroying all that tempted that fearsome wrath. Capita shrugs lightly, her smile casual. Joyful are those that see the sky once the storm clears, but never is the lightning loved. I nod, doing my best to pick up on the pink-haired monster's non-stop metaphors. As humid as it is, we don't get much rain here, let alone thunderstorms. I do remember a couple, and I'm frankly quite glad we didn't get them more often. Rain is awful when you're homeless. It chills you to the bone and forces you to choose between taking fights for shelter that you might not win or risking a cold that hungry bodies can't afford to have. Evidently, the majority of our water comes from vast underground reservoirs deep within the stone of the island. 
One of the hunters told me that part of why the forest is so damn hard to clear is because the roots of the major plant stick all the way down to it. Even if Gladra the Annihilator scoured a thousand acres into ash, the majority of the plants wouldn't even be dead. Just trimmed, for maybe a week at best. It would probably kill a lot of monsters, though, which sounds handy enough to me. Oh, well. I hardly mind the easy souls in the forest nearby. Better than letting the Watcher get them. Soon enough, we climb down into the warehouse basement, opening a pair of dutifully guarded doors, revealing colorful land of excessive opulence. A massive room stretches out before us, kinomancy enchantments dotting every surface with color. Rows of card tables are stretched out next to a bar selling alcohol for cheap, many of them lip to catch dice as well. All sorts of crazy luck games are scattered around, from wheel spinners to a weird ball dropping game to a few tables I can barely divine the purpose of. Off at the far end I spot a stage on which a half dozen barely dressed women are dancing in confusing ways that I think are somehow supposed to be sexy. Opposite to them is a similar stage for equally undressed men performing equally confusing dances, though I find myself staring idly that way regardless. One part of me is thoroughly annoyed by how much another part of me enjoys the sight. My fascination doesn't last long, though, the dancers have such shriveled, underdeveloped souls that I soon tear all three of my eyes away from them in disgust. Countless numbers of far more interesting people are here anyway. A few positively massive souls dot the tables and bar some of which are dressed in such fancy outfits that I suspect Penelope might bow to a few of them. There's no way there aren't at least a few nobles in this building, possibly even true nobles. And with Capita frequenting this place. Do you see it, O oh work of art? Capita asks, flashing a lazy grin. My incision is small, but it will not have healed this soon. Oh yeah, Rowan. I pull my attention away from all the new sights and souls to focus on the beautiful prismatic spirit of a betrayer. Rowan sits at one of the tables, glancing at his current hand with a perfectly neutral expression on his face. I ignore the anger bubbling inside me for now, taking a deep and detailed look at his soul. At first, I see nothing out of the ordinary. His spirit is colorful, beautiful, and as far as I can see, untouched. I scowl and take a deeper look, pushing my senses to the inside, forcing myself to understand his spirit as more than the simple, pretty-looking orbit appears as to my senses. There is more to a soul than that, after all, a folded, maze-like complexity of depth and nuance waits just beneath the surface, always there for me to see, but so far beyond my capacity to understand that I barely ever bother. My power, after all, is intuitive. I don't know how it works or why it feels the way it does. I'm granted no insight and no satisfaction in pushing my senses to that level of detail, so why should I try? I could spend a day this deep in someone's spirit and have nothing to show for it. It doesn't feel like a proper part of what I am, just an added detail that I happen to be capable of by coincidence. I eat and I control, but this? I don't resonate with this. Now I have a good reason to do it anyway. I scour the inside of Rowan's soul, my senses flitting through pathways and directions alien to the understanding of my physical body. I know what I'm looking for, if Capita's description is to be believed. A cut. A crack. A chasm. Sure enough, I eventually find it. The slightest deformity, a tiny opening I'd never have seen had I not been looking for it. The walls of the wound glow ever so slightly purple, the same color as Capita's threads. I see it, I murmur. Now fix it. Yes, yes, I shall. Capita agrees happily. And you shall watch, O oh work of art. Come, come. Play with us. She grabs my arm and starts dragging me towards Rowan's table. W.H. Hey. Let go of me. I demand. My superior you may be, but my master you are not. Capita laughs. Come, you will play. Play and understand. I don't even know how to play cards. I protest. Then learn. Capita yanks me into the chair next to Rowan, to his immediate shock and confusion. She sits at the table as well grinning giddily as she holds two fingers up at the staff member with the deck. Deal us both in, please. Two more for the game. The three other players at the table take one look at Capita and drop their cards on the table, pulling out of the game immediately. They quickly gather their things and leave, while the attendant looks like he wishes he could do the same. M. Miss Capita? Rowan stutters, sweat forming on his forehead as he fails to hide his growing fear. Vita? What are you? 
Why are you both? My cards are good cards. Capita announces loudly, glancing at her hand as the threads of her soul snake slowly in Rowan's direction. What of you, O oh work of art? Dare you bet your cards are better? I just... I literally just told you, I have no idea how to play this. Capita laughs. The game is as easy as life itself. You must bet if your cards are better, or pay to draw if they are worse. I'm not paying you anything. Besides, how am I supposed to know if my cards are better or worse than yours? I demand. You don't. Capita says happily. Did I not just explain? The game is as easy as life. Vita, what are you even doing here? Rowan interjects, gawking at us. I was planning to ask you the same thing, I snap back. Capita smacks some money down on the table, looking at the dealer while pointing in my direction. Tokens for that one, she orders. Bet them, oh work of art, that I may win them back. I glower at her, watching with my third eye as her threads silently push into Rowan's soul. My full attention is on ensuring she does nothing other than fix that gap, and sure enough all her threads seem headed that way, snaking ever so carefully though the impossibly complex pathways that comprise the inside of his being. Though when the staff member running the table takes Capita's money and hands me cheap wooden tokens in their place, I deign to look at my cards as well. I suppose I don't mind betting if it's going to be with her money. Vita, why are you here? Rowan demands again. You shouldn't be in this kind of place. Oh, so, you know that, and yet you're here anyway. I grumble. How much of our money have you lost today? I've made money Todd, no, wait. This is none of your business. Why are you here with the second in command of the Drakens? To play King's Dominance. Capita interrupts testily. Now declare dominance or pay to draw. Rowan sighs, the tiny gap in his soul pulsing slightly as he weighs his need to know with his fear of refusing Capita. No prize for guessing which one he goes with. Bah, whatever. I get the impression that he needs to be nearby for Capita to undo her magic, so a card game is as good an excuse to keep him in place as any. Dominance, Rowan relents, putting a card face up on the table. Dominance. Capita parrots, putting a card from her own hand face up. Um, dominance I guess, I say, picking a random card and putting it face up as well. Ooh, a four coin? Capita coos. Bad hand. I challenge your dominance. During this farce, Capita's soul threads had reached the scratch in Rowan's soul, slowly but surely teasing the purple glow out from around it. Where the foreign glow is removed, the scratch heals itself naturally, closing up on its own. As Capita heals what she's done, I start actually picking up some rules of this Watcher Forsaken game. King's Dominance uses a standard set of cards, each of which has a number from 1 to 10 and a symbol, sword, word, fire, or coin. Your hand is worth the sum of all the card values in it, and you get a bonus in value if you hold multiple of the same symbol. But you also put yourself at risk as certain symbols counter other symbols. If you focus on one, you stand to gain the highest values but have the biggest weaknesses. Sword is like an assassin, I guess, so it kills the guy writing the word, Rowan explains. Word controls public opinion and incites or prevents riots or whatever, so it beats fire. Fire burns wealth to nothing and beats coin, and coin controls your capacity for war, so it beats sword, or something like that. Wait, is Sword supposed to be an assassin, or a whole war? Ah, uh, both? Kind of? Just don't think about it too much. The fucking stupid part of the game is that to draw more cards, you have to pay every other player based on the number of cards they have face up in front of them. Those cards are still part of their hand, which gives you insight on which cards to hang on to if you want to beat them. After a certain point, however, Players that keep winning can eventually construct hands that are so good, it barely matters whether or not they're revealing the entire thing, by the time you construct something to beat them, you've already paid them more money than you could ever possibly get back. The entire experience is annoying, confusing, and ridiculous. I don't see the appeal of it at all. When Capita finishes her soul surgery, I drop my cards on the table. Okay, that's it. I'm done playing. Ask a wise surrender. Capita compliments. Next round, then? No, I mean I'm done playing King's Dominance. Silly work of art, Capita chides, smiling thinly. You are always playing King's Dominance. I roll my eyes, 
double and triple checking that the part of Rowan's sole capita had manipulated is firmly returned to normal, with nothing else added. It looks good to me, and to reassure myself I start looking around at various other members of the Drockants that work in the casino. Sure enough, a good chunk of them have similar purple-tinted scratches, signs that Capito instilled something of her choosing deep inside their minds. What strikes me is how invariably tiny her changes are, each and every one so minuscule it's nearly impossible to notice. Yeah, I think I've waited patiently long enough, Rowan snaps, tossing his own cards back at the dealer in a half. He's not as afraid anymore. Fancy that. Miss Capita, what are you two doing here? Why are you with Vita? I thought your deal with Lynn was to leave our family alone. Fear not, little gambler. Your daughter is uncoerced, unharmed, unimpeded, and in regards to our offer, unconvinced. It is against no deal to ask a simple question, and certainly against no deal to correct a simple lie. What? Rowan glares down Capita and I as if we're the ones doing something bad here, and it almost makes me want to sock him in the jaw. Why do I have to deal with this? Why do I have to call out the person that's supposed to be the one supporting me? The Drockens tried to hire me, I explain, scowling up at him. I said I didn't want to join the people extorting my family, and they said they never extorted you. That you fucking gambled it away. And here I am, finally back from risking my life outside the walls, the first time we've seen each other in almost a month, and where do I find you? In a goddamn casino. Vita, I had no idea you'd gotten bar. No, I snap, cutting him off. Nah, uh That doesn't even matter, Rowan. Come on, we're going home. Huzzah. Capita cheers. To see the home that houses such a glorious. You are not coming. I growl, turning on the cognomancer. And I'm checking Lynn next I see her. I'd better not find any evidence of your bullshit. Her smile drops, another moment of apparent lucidity flashing on her face. Best hope you do find it. O oh, work of art, Capita answers solemnly. I cannot heal that which is scarred over.